Hello, hello, and welcome to Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Joy. We are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. We want to welcome you to our Sunday prime time show. Our topic: sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia and the role of the gender ministry. We want to welcome all of you to discuss this. I have my guests from who are going to be joining me on this uh, in studio to discuss this very important topic. I have uh, Eva joining us from Virginia. Eva, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Eva is joining us from <coughs> Fredericksburg, Virginia. Joining us from all the way from Monrovia is human rights advocate Titus Pakala. Titus, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also, Titus' colleague, but is in uh, Ohio, Sata Sharif. Sata, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you. Hi to everyone. By the way, Sata was elected to the uh, youth parliament in 2014. So she started her advocacy at a very, very young age. Sata, once again, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you. Um, it's, it's the children's parliament. We've got a youth parliament in content. You know, they have the monarch oh, oh, yeah, that's parliament true. and the children's parliament. Yeah, that was the children's parliament. Yeah. All right. And we'll come to that so that you can introduce yourself. Little more, want to welcome our viewers from across the globe. Again, our topic is uh, sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia. And we understand that the uh, Ministry of Gender, Child and Social Protection has a big, big role to play in curbing or controlling or minimizing sexual and gender-based violence. We want to welcome all of you. Please uh, invite a friend, share the show. This is very, very important. The issue of rape and other acts against women and girls is alarming and so we are here to discuss that so let me start by uh, welcoming my guests once more and uh, asking them for a brief introduction let's start with mr titus pakala titus welcome once again and a little bit about yourself so hello to everyone okay so i'm titus b pakala jr I am a human rights campaigner in Liberia and a student of the United Methodist University. I'm also the lead campaigner for March for Justice. And March for Justice is a not-for-profit, non-political movement that uh, focuses on advocating for the rights of women, children, and the entirety of the Liberian people. So I'm more concerned about uh, human rights issues in Liberia. Thank you, Titus. Um if you follow titles on Facebook, you see all the pictures regarding uh, the rape of children and other horrible things. And he's doing some great work right there in Liberia. Let me go to Sata. Sata, welcome and a little bit about yourself. Thank you very much. So my name is Sata F. Sharif. Um, I'm the founder of Action for Justice and Human Rights is a non-governmental organization in Liberia. Um, currently, we have Eric Conwin, who serves as the executive director. So um, the work that I do basically is focused around human rights as well. But um, over the past time, I have been very involved um, with children's rights issue. As you mentioned earlier, um, I serve as the speaker of the Liberian Children's Parliament. So at the level of the Children's Parliament, I had this whole platform where um, I represented the voices of Liberian children from across the 15 countries and had the opportunity as well to represent children both at the UN and the AU. So yeah, so basically that's what I do. I talk for children's rights, girls' rights, and everything. Thank you, Sata. And currently, you are you are in Ohio going to school. Yeah. Um. So in August, I came to school with the help of um the Luchin Church in Liberia, basically who been sponsoring me in school. So I'm currently in Ohio at Wartenberg University, double majoring in English and psychology. But yeah, we had to talk about him over. So I didn't want to bring about my school and stuff like that. You know. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go to Eva. Eva, welcome to Focus on Liberia once again. A little bit about yourself. 
Well, I, I work in healthcare administration. Um, I'll just put that out there. I'm not, not a, a, an expert on human rights or so, but I am a woman and I understand what um, we need and how it affects our community. I work with some groups that work with women and empower girls in Liberia um, um, called My Sisters Keepers. And then I also um, have mentored several youth um, in Liberia. So I understand some of the human rights and um, advocacy that is needed in Liberia um, moving forward. Thank you, thank you, uh, Eva. Quite quite recently, there was uh, both Sata and Titus wrote in the paper, you know, highlighting uh, these issues and the role of the gender ministry. And uh, we're going to get to that, but let's start by just basic and say, when we talk about sexual and gender-based violence that um, you have been involved in Titus and Sata, what does that mean? Let, let me start with Titus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when when we say sexual and gender based violence, it is a term that denotes any crime inflicted against uh, our gender race, be it female, be, be it male. So it could be physical assault, emotional assault, and and so forth. So any crime or any violence inflicted or perpetrated against our gender race it is known to be a sexual and gender based violence. So that is just my understanding about it and how I've been able to coin it to be. Yeah. Right. Um, so just to add up to what Tata said, um, sexual gender based violence uh, is basically, you know, um, violence perpetrated against both men and women, it include children. And so it also um, is based on where the you know, the violence took place, so the uh, base violence, which is include as well domestic violence and all that sexual harassment, sexual abuse, abuse of a child, include rape, include attempted rape, um, everything involved. So looking at the context of, you know, abuse, it's not just focusing, you know, on sexual abuse, it also involves physical abuse, emotional abuse. So everything in one context is just sexual gender-based violence. So when people talk about sexual gender-based violence, they talk about this is like a generalized thing. And then, you know, you have different components within, you know, the set of abuse. I mean, some of the stories, like when you read in Front Page Africa and other newspapers and people posting, um, people send things to different people to post about children being abused, um, um, girls being raped to death, um, 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 like uh, there's also abuse against within the marriage, domestic violence against women. I think I read a story the other day about the, the man, I, I think it was his wife he beat to death um, out of rage. So there's all time, types of multiple stories that come out of Liberia, but one of the main things is what's being done about it. And, and people are concerned that there's not enough awareness, one, and two, there's not enough um, justice being put out there for the victims and um, like the protest by Sata and, and, and Titus is to point out that more needs to be done by the gender, gender ministry, the justice ministry, the Liberian National Police. So it's, it's just to a point where there's not enough that's being done to solve the problem or to make it better. So where does the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection come from? What, what's their role? I know uh, during the protests, uh, Sata and Titus, 
you went at the gender ministry and even uh, quite recently both of you wrote separate letters or articles in the paper calling for you know kind of appalled by what's going on that the, the gender ministry is closed so what was their role um that does you want to go or i should go no you can you can go cool. ahead <laughs> oh, yeah um so the role of the uh, basically the ministry of gender is uh the institution responsible to handle sexual gender-based violence it comes from ensuring that you know perpetrators of sexual gender-based violence or gender-based violence as a whole are prosecuted um the ministry of gender have the uh, domestic violence division they have the gender you know, division, they have the women, they have men, wise men, they have the children. So because the ministry of gender, you know, basically handles all cross-cutting issues as it relates to gender in Liberia, their work is to make sure that when violence are perpetrated against women and girls or violence are perpetrated against men as well, because, you know, so many, there's a lot of cases around some of them in Liberia as well. So the ministry work is to in, ensure that these perpetrators are brought to justice, um, and then the ministry of justice work comes in. And then the ministry is also responsible to ensure that you know necessary uh, fundings are available to fight sexual gender based violence in Liberia, and to also you know support women groups. So when you when they I mean, when you talk about rural women, when you talk about um, women in Liberia, a lot of the women, um, including the International Women's Day, um, all of these events around sexual gender-based violence, the 16 days of activism, all of these events leading to, um, you know, any violence against women, children and men as well, is all part of the Ministry of Gender work. So that's why whenever we do protests and when we go to the ministry to, you know, protest and stuff like that, that's one of the reasons because it's in the ministry minute to ensure that perpetrators are prosecuted. And, you know, and if, it, if it's not working, we go to the ministry because that's their work. All right. So, so Titus, what have been your experience with the Ministry of Gender when it comes to your campaign and your uh, actions against gender-based violence yeah we've been we've been into we've been into a kind of hauling and pulling because oftentimes we've led so many protests and uh, and and matches in in in, in Liberia. But, but for instance at times when we take petition to the the, the ministry of gender children and social protection to adhere to these petitions it becomes a kind of tough tax for, for, for the ministry. And that is where we question their, their inability to, you know, to ratify sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia. Because the, the issue of fighting sexual and gender-based violence, it does not just rely on the ministry's shoulder, but it relies on everyone's responsibility. And so it, it is kind of like intersectionality, like you work, I work, and we both achieve together. But it is not happening in Liberia. And so things are not just the way it, 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 it needs to be. So we always find it more difficult to find a smooth working relationship with the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. Yet there is still an environment we, we are creating to mount pressure to always tell them, this is what you have to do, although we're not into this system, but this is what you have to do to improve the system, to have institutional reform, to, to also have sensitive justice system, and to also improve uh, working working relationship between the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection and that of a uh, civil society organization in Liberia. Thank, thank you. So, so uh, Eva, I know the role of the uh, of the gender ministry. You know, if you look at it, also the, I think the Justice Ministry has a, a division for for uh, violence or those kind of violence, but. Who else should be involved when it comes to uh, fighting uh, gender-based violence? It's a it's a it's a system-wide uh, thing that needs to happen. We need to have the gender ministry, of course, involved, the justice ministry, the LNP. But I think we're we're kind of missing the aspect of having the education ministry involved in teaching from a very young age, teaching um, girls, boys, and everybody. Um, 
what is gender-based violence because some people may grow up and not know what it is. Some kids may not understand that, you know, when somebody touches you and things like that. Um, so it's it's all around and also working with families and the and the outside the community. It's a it's a it's a collective effort with everybody. Um, because when everybody understands what is needed and understands their role and everybody is competent within their role, then the whole system works. But when there are pieces missing here and there, and we don't understand within our culture what gender-based violence is, what sexual abuse is, how it works, how it makes people feel, and for victims to have an avenue to, to be able to, to voice their stories, then the whole system breaks down. It's, it's also important to involve the parents, as you say, or the family. Uh, Titles, I saw some uh, instances, and I've come to you to uh, just go over a few of those occurrences that you have documented on your Facebook. But a few of those things I read was uh, a girl went to get water, you know, to, from the creek, and that's where the perpetrator grabbed her. Another girl in Clarotown went to get water. So sometimes, most of the time, you see parents say, oh, go and do something. Girls are carrying on their regular chores that they're supposed to do as kids in the home. And then the perpetrators come. So, and, you know, someone who went for water is at a community. So what should be the community role and also the role of the family? Looking at victims and perpetrators of this crime that you have witnessed in Liberia. What should be the overall involvement? Yeah, so traditionally in any, in any civilized society, the rule of uh, a given community is to protect the rights of everyone, the rights of children, the rights of women, and the rights of the entitled of everyone. So if, if in an instance of such where, for instance, in the Doe community, uh, a 13 year old child was being raped by infant herons. And they, there were so many community dwellers who were there and could not voice out their dissatisfaction about this occurrence. Because for me, I do not live in Do community. I live far from Do community. But because I got concerned about the situation and I, I got involved and if I inherent well, was arrested and sent to the Moravia Central Prison. So we have a responsibility as, as community dwellers in making sure that we align, you know, these cases of sexual and gender-based violence in our community and so that uh, perpetrators can be brought to light and to face you know, they are, they are days in court or in prison for crimes committed. What does the data say, any one of you, what does the data say about, you know, sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia? Um, the statistic is alarming. Um, quite recently from the sexual gender-based violence, I didn't have to figure at the back of my head, but, um, I was going to the report from, uh, you know, the sexual gender based violence, um, the quarterly report for 2020. And then it's increasing every day. Um, by the end of um, 2019, we had 90% of all the victims of sexual gender based violence were children under the age of 17 years. It happened again in 2018. And right now, I mean, even during COVID-19, you have a lot of women, a lot of children who are in abusive home. They might not come forward to report, you know, uh, they, they are abused because one of the things, like I said in the, the statement I wrote and tattoos as well, is that because the ministry of agenda, if the ministry of agenda is not working and you have all of these cases coming from across the 15 counties and you have, um, um, I mean, children coming in conflict, I mean, coming in contact with abuse. Who do they report it to? Because we already have this culture in Liberia where we normalize rape, we normalize sexual abuse in, in a sense where a guy would touch a girl's shoulder. I mean, they would touch you whatever way they want. And then after the people would be like, ah, that joke. When you go to the police to report the case, they'll ask you, 
oh, what were you wearing when you were wearing? Just care. Maybe it's the way you dress. So people tend to justify, you know, sexual abuse or to justify rape on women dress school and all of these things. So um, the, the statistic is alarming. Sometimes I say you don't really need a rocket scientist to tell you that rape exists and that we have a culture that tend to celebrate rape. And then we have a culture where a lot of these perpetrators, like again, in 2019, can you imagine less than 30% of all the perpetrators of sexual gender-based violence were, you know, <laughs> prosecuted. So now, have, so you have this huge number of, of people sexually abusing women or girls and, and, and they are going free. The, the police, is there, I mean, the level of investigation is slow. You have um, some people are afraid to go to report the case. And then the ministry itself is not doing much to ensure that, you know, women and girls are protected from sexual abuse. So to end it, I would say the statistic is alarming and we need to do something about it. That was, I saw on your, on your Facebook post that last year alone you had what? 846 cases reported? Uh, the first quarter report of uh, 2019 from, uh, that is from January to March was 700 uh, cases. Were 700 just just cases. three months. And 25, 20, yeah, sure. So 25 of, 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 uh, of, of the 700 cases were again raped and 122 physical assault and 44 uh, cases were, were perpetrated uh, against victims below the age of five. And Montserrado County carried 630 cases, rape cases, and uh, Grand Gita carried 41 rape cases, Lima carried uh, 26, uh, Bomb County carried 22, and uh, Magibi carried 19, Sano 12, Greenville is nine, Grand Basel is 12 as well, River says is five, and you have River G1, you have Bapolu 1. So Asata had earlier intimated session gender-based violence in Liberia are increasing on a daily basis. The cases are increasing on a daily basis. So that's where we are in Liberia. Eva but again, we still have a responsibility. Eva, what's running through your mind as you hear those numbers? <laughs> Runs trills to my body. It really does. It, it really saddens me. It, it, it really runs chills through my body as to, it's not even that it's happening, but when you look at it, there's nothing really being done about it. Um, there's no, and when you see those kind of high statistics like that, it means there's no um, justice because if people know that there is harsh um, laws or not even harsh laws that is implemented that is follow through, there's investigation, people are going to jail, things are happening, then maybe the statistics will not be as high as they are, but it's very alarming. I was curious to also know, uh, especially to you, Tyler and Sata, who, who are these people, you know, that are the perpetrators? I mean, like their age range or are they sick people? Who are they? From which social class? Just tell me anything about, or is there any pattern of the perpetrators to say, well, maybe homeless people are the one doing it, or rich people are doing it, or people between the ages of uh, 20 and 25, something to give me an idea, and that may help us too to see, you know, why this is happening. Titus, you have any idea or Sata as to the yeah, profile so, of those so according to the United yeah, so according to the United Nations report of uh, 2018, uh, there were no more, I mean, rape, rape cases or sexual gender based violent cases in Nigeria are perpetrated by normal human beings. You understand, I, I hope you get the, the, this context. So meaning they are, not, they, are not, they are not blind, they're not mentally ill, they are okay in hurt, but they tend to do it for so many reasons, to satisfy their sexual desires, maybe to pay attention to some Cortic society of uh, doing it for ritualistic reasons. So for instance, those I have come across that I have come in physical contact with are people who are physically fit, people who are mentally okay, people who are not sick at all, 
Like for instance, uh, there was there was one guy who name is uh, Infine Herrings. He's a Nigerian man. I mean, he's very hygienic, very very healthy. He had no problem, but then and he he had perpetrated this this crime against this 13 year old girl. And what I understood on on, on that day was that he wanted to have uh, to have uh, leave Liberia from Liberia to Nigeria uh, the, the the next day. So he did. The act on the eve of the day he was to leave Liberia to Nigeria, and so people were assuming that this Nigerian man was doing this because he wanted to go and pay uh, homage to his, to his traditional cause. So I'm just trying to say that people do these things for different reasons, and according to the United Nations report of 2018 as well, in Liberia, many crimes of sexual and gender-based violence in 2018 was perpetrated by the age range of uh, 20 to 35, 20 to 35. But as, as time goes back and forth, we see the age index tend to change. Now, in, in 2019, I came, I came in close contact with a 47-year-old man who raped a, a, a six-year-old child, just imagine. So there is, there is an unprecedented age index of the occurrence of sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia. Yes, yeah, so that's what I know about, and that's how I have come in contact with people whom I have seen. Can I make uh, one point, Dennis? I know um, Titus said that these people seem, you know, they're physical and they're mental, but for you to rape a child or for you to do those kind of gender um, violence against a person, there's something mental there's something mentally wrong with you. Um, you have people that who are pedophiles and, um, um, and and those kind of, I'm not, I don't know all the medical terms, but there's something mentally wrong with you for you to, to do that to a child. Even if you say you're doing it for rituals or, or this and that, but for you as a, a person for, to come to your mind to, to rape a little child or to rape a woman to death or even, even when you talk about uh, marriages where husbands abuse their wives or, or, or things like that, there's something mentally that's wrong with you. Maybe it's self-esteem self issue. Maybe it's some, um, um, uh, I don't even wanna say depression or whatever, but there's something mental that's there. That's why you did what you did. You might have to be physically, you might look at a person, they might look physically okay, but there's something mental if you do that to a person. Um, so I just wanted to add up to what Tatas and Eva said. Um, the, the issue about the perpetrators, a, a perpetrator of rape or sexual abuse can be anyone. The point is, in most of you know the cases that have been reported, um, almost seventy percent are people who personally know you know the fit. Um, they are in our homes. They could be, I mean, even women are abusing as well. You have, so I mean, the issue of abuse, it could be anyone, somebody who's even blind as well. You know, um, a blind person can sexually abuse somebody who's physically challenged. So the perpetrator of sexual abuse can be anyone. So the point is, all we can do is to protect you know, children or people who are in the most, you know, um, advantage stage of being sexually abused to protect them from uh, 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 predators, to protect them from these molesters. That's all we can do. And you never know who's going to be a perpetrator. That's the thing about the whole situation. Somebody, it could be someone who you rely on for support. It could be somebody who you value and respect. It could be your brother. It could be your sister or your uncle in the home. So, I mean, perpetrators, I just, anyone, somebody. Right. And that's you what know. I was coming to, in, the issue of incest. Someone in the same family abusing another girl. Are there cases like that too in Liberia? It's a lot. It's terrible. I mean, but the point is, sexual, sexual abuse as a whole 
brother is your brother or your, I mean, your sister or your uncle or whoever. I mean, it's something that we need to discourage at all level. But most of these children that are abused, most of the children that, um, you know, feature at the scrub because of sexual violence. I mean, the perpetrators are people who know them. They will send them to buy something and then, or send the person in their room by the, mo the moment the child comes back. They sexually abuse them. So, I mean, it's terrible and it's so horrible that we have to be talking about this because family members should be the one protecting, you know, a child. A child should be given special care and all that, but not only are we protecting children from, uh, you know, molesters that are out there, we are also protecting them from their family members who are predators as well. That is sad. That, that brings us to our COVID-19 issue. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia and the role the Ministry of Gender should be playing. If you want to join the conversation, please call. The number is 605-313-6004. The code is 791403. That brings me into, both of you wrote, in a, a statement in the paper saying, well, uh, there has been, let me start with uh, titles. Tell me about what you wrote about. So the, the COVID, the COVID, the COVID uh, is here, COVID-19 is here. It is overwhelming uh, our health system. It is ruining families. It is uh, separating our loved ones from us. We agree, uh, but there is one thing we too, we, we too should take into consideration that there is there is one pandemic, there is one pandemic that is a shadow pandemic that is sexual and gender-based violence in the midst of uh, the, the coronavirus. So what I, I, I supported Sata, Sata's uh, opinion in Addison when she wrote the, the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection to do more in terms of uh, protecting women and children in Liberia. So I also recommended the government of Liberia to maintain the Ministry of Gender and uh, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection to increase its community response plan for victims of sexual and gender-based violence. And I also asked the government of Liberia to generate a stimulus package or resources so that it, it can uh, meet up with a response team to, to combating sexual and gender-based violence in various uh, vulnerable community. And another recommendation came out that the third recommendation was to develop a hotline to support victims uh, responsive, you know, responsiveness on, on crimes that have been inflicted on them. So for example, if someone who lives in Claritin is, 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 being, is being abused, can have access to maybe 4455 or 911 to call the, the gender ministry to say, oh, I'm, I'm being abused by my partner and I need help, I need support, you know? So I also recommended that the government should uh, develop a hotline system to provide, uh, to support victims of sexual and gender-based violence, sharing their own story to the ministry as well. So I also asked the government of Liberia to educate local communities, dwellers in simple Liberian language. Don't speak BB book, tell the people, uh, when the people, when somebody rape you, report this, how to report this to which person you need to report this to. Let the English be simple and clear to the Liberian people because not everyone goes to school. Not everyone has been in classroom. So our day-to-day -day conversation should be very simple, especially in area of this, of this COVID-19. Because if we want to escape triple or double impact of this COVID-19, we should be prepared enough to face the challenge of sexual and gender-based violence. Because sexual and gender-based violence had been here before COVID-19 came. So we should also understand the impact of COVID-19 and the, and the impact of, of sexual and gender-based violence. Well, COVID-19 is about to leave Liberia, the, the war at large. But if we do not stand strong, sexual and gender-based violence could be the next you know, uh, epidemic in, in Africa or the war at large. It is already increasing in Liberia. So the main thing, to do is that we should provide safe space for the people of Liberia, be it women, children, be it girls, and the entire of the of the Liberian people, so that they can feel part of our society, even when crimes of sexual and gender-based violence have been inflicted on them. So 
Those were my recommendations to the government in support of Sata Sheri, who also wrote the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection, asking them to do more amid this coronavirus situation. Because global health experts also warn that in, in, in time of, of such, especially during time of COVID-19, there will be an increasing amount of sexual and gender-based violence, especially uh, intimate, intimate uh, violence crime, where, you know, my, 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 my fiancé and I, we are the same place, or my girlfriend and I, but yet I still see it necessary to beating on her, to sexually abusing her. So there are going to be increasing amount of these, of these crimes. So to stop this amount of these crimes is to make sure that we identify key areas of uh, the Ministry of Gender Responsibility and to making sure that at least uh, sexual and gender-based violence can be dealt with just as COVID-19 is being dealt with in Nigeria. Yeah, and, and, and Sata, you know, I don't know what brought that to your mind. I was not even thinking about it. And you, 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 I mean, you were, that was just quick thinking on your feet. You know, how did you come to that realization? Were you reading about it, that you wrote that powerful letter? And I saw in front page Africa, you got the gender minister, the gender minister talking. Um, the thing is, for us, you know, when you're so passionate about something and, um, in such a crisis, I mean, I was thinking about it and then I was like, I mean, are people even thinking about, you know, sexual gender-based violence during COVID-19? And then luckily, I'm actually following the um, head of WHO, he's an African, and he, and he also made a statement, I was like, bang, that's the point I've been waiting for, even WHO and other experts. So when it came to my mind, it was just me, and then I said, okay, maybe I'm being paranoid about such a gender-based violence and stuff like that. But by the time I started researching, um, even in the U.S., uh, there were reports about, you know, intimate partner violence increasing, I mean, increasing because of, you know, COVID-19. And a lot of people are not reporting it because they are either afraid to go to the hospital or, I mean, people are concerned with getting jobs and stuff like that. So if we had this similar situation in Liberia. So all of these things kept coming to my mind. And so I started investigating about the Ministry of Gender. If in Liberia, the ministry was still open if they were responding to sexual gender based violence. And it was 100% confirmed that the ministry of gender was listed as a no essential institution. And then I listened to the minister um, before the, 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 the you know, the lockdown was extended to 90 days. And then when she was outlining the work of the ministry during COVID-19, the only thing she said was the ministry was included in the uh, psychosocial period. So what they'll be doing is to get the food for elderly and stuff like that. There was nothing being said about sexual gender based violence. So I was like, this is a important issue that we should be looking at because as people go in lockdown, the state of emergency, a lot of people will be paying attention on how we get health services to people and stuff like that. What about women and children that are in abusive home where domestic violence is on the increase? Who do they report to if the ministry is closed? That's what uh, I reached out to Front Page Africa and said, I have a concern. And then luckily for me, Front Page Africa was waiting to share my concern. And then the minister came out and said what she said. So I was like, okay, the ministry is being strategic. I agree. They said the government placed them on the psychosocial pedals so that will be responding to SGBV. But a week ago, there was nothing being said. I'm not trying to take the glory. I'm sure that is not trying to take the glory that for once we are able to bring to the ministry attention that I need to do something. But the point is that should be providing services. And if they forget, okay, we remind you, but you got to be practical in what you do. The national call center should be responsive. I mean, you should have people working from home maybe they don't know how to work from home but at least you should think about it that's just our point i was so striking and i was so proud of you and little titles also piggyback on that and that was very because imagine you know a kid and you say abusive home a kid living with someone at least when the parents leave home and go to work you have free time to play 
right? Because you are so much afraid of them. Now they are there 24 7. Can you imagine what you're going to go through? But hold that thought, Eva. Let me bring in our first color. Our first color here. Call up uh, your name and where you calling from. 3251. Hello. Hi, my name is Naomi. Um, like... Hello, Naomi. Welcome to Focus on Liberia. Your question or comment? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to commend you all um, for having this type of discussion. Um, I think that this is a pillar. I actually want to stop this discussion, so I have to join um, the conversation. Na Na Naomi, your, your, phone was, your phone was a little chubby. Can, can you adjust it? Can you hear me now? There's a lot of background noise, but go ahead. Okay. Um, but what I was saying was, um, I, I know we focus a lot on women and children, but what about the men of Liberia who are also enduring sexual abuse? Good. All right. Eva, you're going to take that? So we are focusing on women and children. What's about the men? What's about me? Uh, well, with the men, and and for what I've seen, because I've I've you know heard things, especially for some men, you know, about a, a, at a young age, being you know. Uh, All participants by, are muted, and they can unmute themselves. Women, or or so, but um, I, I don't know the statistical numbers, but not a lot of men, uh, from what I've seen come out and say, oh, I'm being, you know, sexually abused because there's a stigma or, or so in our society where, oh, men don't get abused. You know, that it's, it's, it's a woman, she came up to you, go ahead and, and do whatever, you know, that, that it's okay um, for men. But there are men that do get abused, not just sexually, but domestically. And, um, but a lot of men don't come forth with their stories because they don't want to be uh, stigmatized or people to make fun of them. But um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see much being done. And we focus more on the women and the children because that's most of the cases that we see. That's most of the cases that are reported. So that's that's what it's being focused on. Yes, they're more vulnerable. And these days now we have, um, you know, uh, same sex abuses. So men can be abused also. So, you know, people need to keep an eye on that. Yeah, I've seen it. Um, I've, 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 I've seen some of it. And people forget that abuse can also be verbal. There, there can be, it's not just physical. There's, there's verbal abuse. Um, um, that can come from both men and women. You know, like sometimes you have a man in the house, he's doing all you can do, but you have the woman just, you know, cussing at him, telling him he's useless, this, this, that, and the other. That's a form of abuse also. And then uh, that verbal abuse leads to mental abuse where, you know, at, even during this time, you have everybody in the house and it's like a low pressure cooker. She's nagging, she's saying this to him and this and that. And sometimes it might lead some people to to react in a certain way, and then it becomes oh, that domestic violence part of it adds onto it, where he might hit on her, or might do something her, on her, for her. And they even have women that jump men to fight. You know that 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 they play on that because they know they might not hit them or they might not do something to them, so they play on that. And they're the perpetrators, and they're the one that start the problem. But if he does something to us, to her, then they look at it as, oh, he beat on her. So um, those issues do exist, but we don't talk about them much. But they do exist. My next caller, Telvina, you are live. Hi. Hello there. I just want to say. 
loud enough. Not, not a little bit louder okay. if you can. Okay. Um, I I wanted to take you to the guest out there at the Eva Hill amplifying her voice from yes to the end over over thank you Eva and everybody else there. I, mm. I wanted to add uh, some stats to what you guys were saying uh, okay. and some data uh, to give you give you some data. I had the uh, opportunity uh, to review data on this issue for six years, which I have in my position. And, um, I, but I, I'm not going to talk about six years. I want to talk about how forward to get this year because one question you asked about the data, and that caught my attention. So, in, I'll give you an example, in 2012, in, in 2007, they reported cases for all the different counties. But I want, I'll take that. So for example, in 2007, there were only eight cases reported. In 2018, nine cases. For the mid-year report that Jenna put out, only three cases. Um, in in Fifth Mount, there were 63 cases. And then in, in 2017, in 2018, there were 31 cases. And then the mid-year report for 2019, only four cases. And you look at River and River Test, for example. 2017, 54 cases, 2018, 27 cases, and a mid-year report of 2019, only one case. So it tells you that the numbers are dropping. People, the people are not believing the system, and so they're not reporting as much. Uh, I'm not going to go to the whole 15 counties, but these are just some of the numbers for that. But, but let me fast forward a little bit. So there were the case, of the cases that were reported, say for 2007, 2017, were 1,685 cases. Of those cases, we were looking at, there were, so there were about, there were 586 cases that uh, people that were arrested from that. The people hmm. that, the, the, those of, um, the cases that went to court, there were, so there were small amounts, but stop, let me, let me find numbers right here. Uh, but that that is even less important. What it is it's just as important. But I want the main thing I wanted to touch on here is that the specifics of the perpetrators. So in 2017, we have 1.2 percent of the perpetrators that were that, that were convicted. Wow. In 2018, it was 0.60. In, two, in 2019, from January to July, the the mid year report 0.60. So what does that tell you? It's disturbing, it makes you uncomfortable, and so you know, so everybody put there a lot of work that needs to be and, yeah. and, and I don't think this, these numbers are really factual, because thinking about it, I don't think everybody's coming, for this is just what gender is reporting. Yeah. A lot of other people, those numbers that are coming through from the other in the counties and other places. But more alarming, of the number of cases reported for, you know, like I said, the 2017 to 2019, in 2017, but we had 121 cases of children zero to five years. That blew my mind away. In 2019, the media report, 91 cases of zero to five years. Who's breaking zero to five years? I mean, I any case for that matter, but zero to five years. Who's doing that? So there's so much work to do. I mean, there's so much data to you know, talk about, but I just want to add some numbers to that. I think somebody was trying to speak, but I just wanted to, to address that. Thank uh, you. And I put some numbers to this. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you for. Uh, but let me make this clear, right? Um, I when I say I speak of the Liberian Children's Parliament, even after if there's one thing I had, um, I mean I because I don't like to just talk without doing you know research and stuff like that. So I mean. I was constantly in the SGBV division and I was with um, the, uh, the data analysts and seeing everything. One of the reasons why you will see a lot of the number of S I mean, SGBV cases drop, let's take for example, if you had like this number in 2018 and then it dropped 
I mean, like you mentioned about 1% of the perpetrators were prosecuted or uh, uh, went to social number. It's because the number of referral institutions dropped. So when we had the UN in Liberia, the United Nations was sponsoring a lot of the, the institutions that are responsible for responding to such a gender-based violence. By the time the United Nations left Liberia and we started you know, losing institutions that were supporting SGBB response. You stop receiving cases from these organizations. For example, um, I run an NGO and if I was supporting like 10 organizations in my give it a report rape cases, and then the next year I can't afford to support those 10 institutions again to report to my institution so that I can send the report to the Ministry of Gender and then only five institutions are reporting. It means the number of cases would definitely drop. So it's not about um, how many um, cases for that time, it's also about how many institutions are ready reporting to the Ministry of Gender because the Ministry of Colette uh, all these cases from the 15 counties, from CB, uh, from organizations, from, from the ministerial uh, office in the counties, they, they, the ministerial general coordinator will report to the central office, and then the SGBV division will put everything together. So if the number of institutions are dropping, it means there's a gap. We need more people to do referral. I'm, I'm also doing online referral. My organization run a system that also ask people if you are in danger and you need help, all you need to do is send message to, my, to our website and our psychosocial you know, officers will be there to talk to you and stuff like that. If I was to remove you know, my online platform of advocates and stuff like that, I only leave that does again to advocate. How many voices do you have talking about SDBV? We only have one. So it means that does get spread in the whole count in the whole of Liberia. And if you only have the Ministry of Gender responding or doing referral, you only have few number of cases. So it's not like we trying to say that the Ministry of Gender oh is not doing anything. The point is a lot more needs to be done. Most of the numbers that you were stating, all the numbers, this is good that we all talk about this. This is not about sharing bling or attacking someone, but if someone or the minister is not doing enough, we should be there to tell the minister that you're not doing enough. A lot still needs to be done because they're receiving money from UNICEF. We are yet to tell them do the work. We are using our resources as well so that you do more. So this is not about attacking them or telling someone, okay, I mean, less was reported before in this year, a lot is reported or more was reported before now, less is reported. The only reason why less is reported is because we have less institutions reporting the cases. Simple. And Eva, I, let me ask something before you come up with your, is uh, because we in the United States, we have a lot of organization, a lot of, uh, I don't know of any that focus on what Sata just said, you know, collecting the data. So is that, is that something that people have to look into to see, not just maybe, you know, buying stuff and doing other things, but having people to be able to report these kind of instances. Your thought? Um, um, for what Sata said, it's, it's, it's very disturbing because what one of the major roles of the gender ministry should be collecting data and not only collecting data, be the researcher themselves, because you have to research yourself to figure out what is needed. If you're not researching yourself to figure out exactly what is needed within the communities, then how how are you doing your job or how do you- uh, Eva, do you I'm not cutting off, I just wanna admit, they also researching, but my point is, not a lot of organizations. The ministry have social workers on the field working. For example, they have CWOs. They have uh, 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 child welfare officers, and um, they coordinating committee working in communities working with social workers. So, if you have a case and you report it to the CWO or the CWC, which is the child welfare committee, the CWC take the case 
and work with um, the Women and Children Protection Session. But if another organization who's also doing SGBV response, like, um, like say, uh, Concern Liberia or, you know, an institution doing sexual and gender based response, and then somebody went to the organization and said, oh, I was abused. And the organization is trained with referral. There's a whole system, there's a referral system that the ministry news. So if that organization also is working with the CSO and the CBOs, so you have like, let's say, five persons, right? And then um, Tom Khan, the organization who's also helping the ministry job and say, oh, we don't have money anymore to do referral. So we're not work. You only have four left, right? So it means all the cases that person needs to get where the ministry cannot reach, their staff cannot reach, it means the organization will not be able to reach there. That was my point. What well, I'm saying is, point. even though these organizations stop off, Mm -hmm. It is the sole responsibility. You are outsourcing your job to somebody else. And when that person leaves, it comes back to you to be responsible. It is their central responsibility. It's not these other UN or other outside organizations. If they're assisting you, yes, but you are the owner of that statistics. You're supposed to be the one that's supposed to be driving. If an organization drops out, you have to be there to fill in that in that in that um, um, space it is not anybody else's job their main job to do that it is Budget your job money. it is your ownership you own it you do it that's an excuse that's a very poor excuse that they have to say oh this organization drop or this person drop you own that that's your main responsibility so now if you see that these other four organizations you say you don't have enough staff why is that what is in your budget? What you have, you have the counties. Your budget should include enough field workers pay, should include enough operations to be able to handle and get these statistics and get people out there. Your budget has to handle that. So, and one of the other main things that we don't have and that's also going to impact is since what is it, 2018, we're supposed to do the census. Part of the census, getting the census is part of getting these demographics and getting who is where and who is what. Where is there a cluster of women? Where is there a cluster of children? Where is there a cluster of the, of the vulnerable populations? Because in that census, I don't know how they do it in Liberia, but I know in America when they do the census, they ask you about who's in the household. They ask you how much income is coming in that household. And they ask you other questions in that census. So if we don't get that uh, uh, critical information, how are we making budget? How are we getting the right statistics? For me, even though they have these statistics, but for me, there is a flaw in it. It's a major flaw in the statistics that they have. Um, again, I uh, just want to say that the issue about the budget. Hold on, Sadia. Okay. Hold on, Sadia. The issue about the budget, Ministry of Gender don't have control over that. The left the ledger too as well. Sometimes they cut the ministry budget down. I just want to be realistic, even though we call it on the ministry to do a lot, but the left the ledger play a huge role in this process. No, I know. I'm just saying you as you as a ministry have to advocate for your budget. You have to be out, out there to advocate for your budget. This is what I need. And for the ministry, for me, it's a conflict of interest. For me, the ministry should be a kind of an outside um, in the government, but an outside institution. Because with them being part of the cabinet of with the president, they rely, they can't come out and say, oh, the GOL is not giving me money. Oh, the this is not giving me money because they hire you. So they are a, 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 a group that's supposed to also advocate and also be there for the vulnerable women, children, or whoever. But if they're getting their budget strictly from, you know, underneath the, the CBL or from other places, and I don't know if they're allowed to go out and, and get um, um, budget from other places. I know maybe the UN might help us um, here and there, but for them being a, a ministry under the cabinet, I think sometimes it put in a conflict of interest of them being able to voice or being able to ask for what is needed. On a, on a yeah, normal so, situation, <laughs> the government is supposed to be for the people. But let me bring Titus in the conversation. And Titus, what yeah. I want you to what I want you to also comment on is because we were afraid that during COVID nineteen, you know, these cases might you know go up. So, what is the information that you are getting?
concerning the increase or the decrease of these uh, instances during COVID. So you can respond and then add that to your answer. Uh, okay, so should I respond to the, uh, to the initial conversation? No, respond to the initial conversation and then you can add to what I just said. Oh, okay. okay. So, like, Sata and uh, Ifa were discussing about the budget and statistics. Uh, statistics are not, do not, they are not 100% clear. That's why we should also understand. And this is why people, people do, or institutions do shadow report. When the government, when a government agency gives certain statistics of an occurrence, and if, if the statistic is not fair enough, well, since indeed the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection is a government ministry, obviously you now have the president telling the, the Ministry of Gender that this statistic is not okay because he appoints the Ministry of Gender. So there are multilateral institutions, civil society organizations that do shadow report to contest against these statistics. So for instance, if Sata Sherry will say, Five persons were raped in Liberia in 2018. Then Tatos Pakala says seven, seven, seventy percent of this number. And so you will have you 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 get to understand that there are conflicting. There will be conflicting statistics. But then you should also agree that the issue here on ground is that sexual and gender-based violence as a crime is increasing in Liberia. So to have a resourceful statistics, especially in Liberia, relative to sexual and gender-based violence. In Liberia, it's kind of very complicated, but statistics are not just a sign. So when it comes to the budget as well, well, I, I don't want to say that the, the Ministry of Gender and Children and Social Protection has some issue of budget constraint. There's no budget constraint when it comes to the function or the workings of the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. You have the United Nations women that support the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. Of two, in 2018, over 2 million was, was given to the Ministry of Gender, Not Children, and Social Protection to, to empower women to fight against sexual and gender-based violence. You, you, ha you had the Swedish form as well. You have money from the world, and millions of dollars were given to the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection. But you also have hundreds of thousands in the national budget that is to support the statutory workings of the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection. So it is not of a budget, budgetary constraint. There's no constraint. So the only thing we need to have in Liberia is institutional reform, and we should forget about appointing people based on political accommodation. You understand? We should we should we should appoint people based on their expertise, based on what they know about this particular field, about how they they, they, they tend to solve these issues of sexual and gender-based violence. Is that you can take and, and somebody who can who can repair radio to go and repair aircraft? You you obviously you can. The person will damage an aircraft. You will not do that. So in Liberia, we have a kind of political system where once you support Tatos V. Pakala and Tatos V. Pakala becomes president of Liberia, if I know Sata Sheri, Sata Sheri is a tough talking person. Well, I take her and carry her to Ministry of Finance or carry her to the, the, the Port Authority, which is not good. And traditionally in Liberia, it has been practiced. And I think we need to get away with these practices and so that we can make Liberia to be a country where the rights of children, the rights of women, and the rights of the entitled of the Liberian people can be protected. So with the last answer to your question, this is COVID-19. And the issue of sexual and gender-based violence is occurring. And I can tell you for free, even in Clarendon here, just day before yesterday, I had to report a 17-year-old boy, 17-year-old boy who attempted to rape a six-year-old child. It's happening all around here. And, and uh, I was able to have reported this case to a nearby, you know, police station. And the police got involved. And at the end of the day, they went, they do tests at a nearby hospital. And uh, as God will have it, the, the, the guy did not penetrate uh, the, the, this child. So the issue of sexual and gender-based violence is occurring in the midst of this COVID-19. And this is what we, we are asking the government of Liberia to have a sensitive ref reform, institutional reform, so that sexual and gender-based violence cannot be another, you know, shadow epidemic that will have a double or triple impact on the lives of, of, of the women and children of Liberia. So rape, violence against women, against men, against boys, 
they are all occurring in Liberia and made this COVID-19. But the only way we can fight it is to have a general, general and mutual cooperation between government agency, multilateral organization, uh, pri private, private institution, civil society organization, activists and advocates. Let's leave too many, you know, unnecessary debates. Let's leave the, the jobs, let's leave throwing jobs on one another. Let's recommend the national government, read a research paper, do a concept paper, recommend to the government, this is what you have to do. Like what Sada Shari is doing around here, writing letter to the Ministry of Gender, telling them to do this. Now, when we are doing this as the youthful population of Liberia, that constitute more than 75 to 80% of Liberia's population, then we are making Liberia to move forward. But we cannot always sit and criticize and not doing well. But we are not also saying that the government is not automatically doing its best. The government is trying, but we have to tell the government, this is what you have to do, honorable minister. But can I come in, Dennis? For me, as a person to have to tell the government to do a job that they're supposed to do, like you said, Titus, then that means there's people in there that are not competent enough to understand what they are put there to do. They're, what are you put there to do? Sata has to write a letter to let you know that in COVID-19, that there will, be, there, will not, there, will, there will be an increase and that you should be open and that you should be an essential um, 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 uh, organization to help people within this time, even without COVID-19. When you look at the whole setup, of the whole thing, and I could be wrong. Even do you, do we have safe houses set up for women to go to? Do we have different call centers for women to call? Do we have um, 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 places for children to be put? Is there a circle of working with the different? Because we're forgetting one main aspect of this whole thing is the LMP. They should be also be collecting data that should go also to the ministry. They should be working hand in hand with the ministry and also with the Justin ministry. So for Titus and for Sata and other people to come out and tell you things to do things that are listed in your responsibilities, that is alarming. And I'm not trying to put anybody down or anything, but when you use the word competent to incompetent to people, they think that you're cussing them. Incompetent means that you don't have the skills. You don't know what resources are needed. You don't know what it is you're supposed to do for the job to perform the job it, that you're supposed to do. So if Sata has to write a letter and Titus has to do that before you can say, this is what I need to do, then you as that minister, you're, you're, not, you're not performing in your role that you're supposed to be performing in. You should be reaching out to people like Sata and Titus to be like, I know you guys are in the community doing so and so, how can you guys join us in this fight or how can you guys help us to make this happen? Mm -hmm. That's where my major problem is with the ministry is you're not playing your role in what it is you're supposed to be doing. I don't know if because you so, don't know so, how so, 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 or Eva, you don't have do the do? resources. What, what do we do in that instance, Eva? Do we need a minister, gender minister? Gender minister? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like any job if you're not performing to your to your to your capacity and what is I don't I don't know her specific background or or what, where she comes into this because I don't know if she has a, a social worker background or if she did this before or what her background is but from what I'm seeing is are you the right person for the job are you able mm -hmm. to do this job that's that's where my question lies and it's not no shade no nothing I'm just seriously asking. Are you the right person? Are you the right one to handle this job at this point? Let, let me look at another side about the law. And uh, Eva, I was watching the program, you know, that you were on yesterday, very good conversation. And uh, one of the ladies said something that really struck me, that uh, Liberia is signatory to most of these conventions, starting with the Declaration of Independence down there. Okay, but when we get home now, even though we went to Geneva and signed this, when we come home, are we making this part and parcel of our own laws, right? Because you can't, you, you don't have a police who go poop somebody over in the street and say, hey, you violated the Declaration of Independence, right? It got to be a local law that I are, are, are there laws or titles and or concerning 
you know, SGBV on the books? Yeah. Yep. Um, so be yeah, there are laws like we have the rib law, we have the children's law, um, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children and the African chapter on the rights and welfare of children was domesticated in the Liberian children law. So yeah, um, when Liberia went to the UN and signed, you know, the UN Convention, and when it went to the AU, and when it went other places, Geneva and other areas, to so say, oh, we commit to women and children, we commit to protect the rights of you know, women and children. We came back in Liberia, the children's law was signed as a way of domesticating to protect children. And you have other laws, um, other optional protocols as well. Um, you have different manifesto, you have the women manifesto, you have um, um, the girls manifesto and some other laws. So yeah, we have the rape law and some other, you know, instruments that are protecting the rights and welfare of children in Liberia. And I also wanted to say something that, I mean, I know the Ministry of Gender play a huge role in the fight against sexual gender-based violence. But the issue, uh, another issue is that um, we have a system, there's this whole a system in place that kind of not only limit you know, such a gender bit. I mean, the manuscript form doing their work as well, but we also have a society that tend to normalize such a gender based violence. We also have the legislature as well, who, when it comes to, you know, like supporting and giving the necessary support that the ministry needs. I remember when I was at Children's Parliament, right? Uh, we had to go protest for the Less literature to add us to the Ministry of Gender budget because uh, the Children's Parliament work is facilitated by the Ministry of Gender. And at the end of the day, all the time we spent there protesting, negotiating, and doing this and doing that, they didn't include us in the budget. I mean, and it was a whole big conversation. So if I have something to say right now, is that, I mean, Everyone needs to do something right now from the, the, the Ministry of Gender, they need to strengthen their system, even the call center that Tata has mentioned about, it needs to be strengthened right now. And then um, going to the, the, the government, the Ministry of Justice as well, do they even have, I, I mean, in terms of investigating all these cases that come in. Sometimes when, when, when some of these sexual abuse cases go to the police and then they'll be asking all kinds of questions like, um, I'm sure it was because of your dress school or where were you doing that time and all, the, all of those things. People need more training, especially the Women and Children Protection Session. They need to be trained. Some of these people that ask questions that are not even necessary, that doesn't even fit the kind of job that they do. And then coming down to we as a society, when somebody rape a child, instead of you compromising it as a family matter, you should report it. And then when you report the case, don't just sit there follow up before the police compromise the case, before the ministry agenda don't do that job because in most of the cases, some of the social workers will not follow up and blah, blah, blah. It's a whole long case. And then you go to the court again. When you go to the court, the fees that they charge for, from these rape victims. I was sitting right there a few months ago before I came. I think I was in the same office before I came on campus. We were to the court. There was this case about um, a deaf and dumb child who was sexually abused and then we went to the court and then there were all these fees and money that had to be paid. The lady who accomplished uh, the victim, she didn't have money. I mean, the, the, the survivor, she didn't have money. She was like, you know what? I can't do this anymore. We had to pay the money. There was no social worker on the ground and uh, you have the court system requesting money. So all of these things coupled and place together. There are a lot of issues that we need to look at from society standpoint to the ministry to support and everything. So it's a whole blanket of different issues. How do we confront it? Like, like we're doing now, we gotta start the conversation, continue to push the ministry of gender and have the necessary people in place to do the work. I mean, it's important right now, but this is it. This is where we are. The small resource we have now to fight COVID-19, 
let's help in the process. All right. Now, and that's very, very important uh, that everybody plays a role. I want to understand from you in Liberia, uh, Mili, Titus, and Sada, what is the public reaction to these things? I understand when uh, maybe a child is raped, you know, the neighborhood it will be outraged, but it's not only a child. People even rape their own spouses, right? So I there was also a report of a, a same-sex party being held, and the people in the neighborhood were so outraged about that, they ransacked the place. Do you see that same outrage when it comes to the response to uh, this uh, gender-based violence? Like if, uh, you know, someone raped a woman, are the people outraged the same way they are outraged about same sex? Why is that? Is this, Sata, you want to respond, then I come in? No, go ahead, Sata. Well, <laughs> well, you see, uh, it is not as such because not, not frequently people do understand what actually is raped and people still do not understand the context of sexual and gender-based violence. In fact, so where I went to do investigation, my team and I we went in community and there were people who still could not believe that uh, infant herons, who is currently at the Moravia Central Prison, had raped a 13-year-old child. They said, that la, Latina happy in our Liberian way of expressing ourselves. Ain't happy that we can't believe it. How that, that, that female will go look at a small girl and go and go and go ha, have sex with that girl. Your body don't get where to do, you know? So these are denigrating and demeaning comments that come from uh, communities dweller until you educate them that rape is a crime before they know that indeed it is a crime. So most often they do not, they do not believe, they are not, they're not organizing themselves to say, look, we have to, uh, come into public outrage, advocate against sexual and gender-based violence, unlike a few other persons who will always come out to say, well, this is a serious threat against, you know, humanity, and we have to advocate against sexual and gender-based violence. That is when you see concerned citizens, that is when you see students will come out to say, let's get in the street, petition this agency, tell the government to do this, and so that things can work out. It, it is very sad at times when you call for a public march, when you call for a protest, you have to beg people. In fact, you have to tell them, I will buy you t-shirt. I will buy you, I will buy you a what? So I will get you this so that you can be part of history. No, that is not what we, we, we think we, we should do in Liberia. And that is what happening. People are not just concerned about sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia. They're not into this kind of public outrage. We are being vociferous and saying, well, you have to do this. You need to get the rave with, with sexual and gender-based violence. It's not happening. And people are compromising sexual and gender-based violence in homes. Mind you, a mother, a child of, of this, of this, of this, uh, a mother of this child told us, told me that had already reported this, this case to the to the to the Bourgeois Island Magisterial Court that we should forget about the entire case. The woman told me in her librarian way of expressing herself. That was a poor your two four. Let me hold the yeah because la la ti mi ana no you know. So I try to explain it to her what is sexual and gender based violence, what is even rape, and how does it cause harm to the future of her child before she accepted us and we proceed with the investigation. And that was when infant parents was being incarcerated. So a lot of time people are not really concerned about this uh, issue of, of, of rape in Liberia. Like, what happened to these people when after they are incarcerated or caught? Do you follow up to see what else happened to them or by the time you turn your back, they're gone? What's the story? The Santa, I think you can agree with me, they have three court terms at the, at the Moravia Central Prison and they, they're going to face pre-trial detention. After their pre-trial detention, they, they, have to, they have to appear in a court of competent jurisdiction that is according to the Penal Code of Liberia. You have to appear in a code of competent jurisdiction to be investigated as to whether you committed the crime or not. Because most of the crimes are, 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 are accusations. They are accusations. Now, they are accused of the crime. They are proven guilty or innocent until they, are, they, they have appeared in a code of competent jurisdiction. So what we often do is not just reporting the crime and getting them incarcerated and leaving them, but what we also tell the government to do is that they should have a speedy trial so as we can know as to whether they've actually committed the crime. Like for instance, uh, in, the, in, in the case of uh, the former uh, student leader who, who was accused of raping someone, we, 
for me, I, I stood up very firmly and I told the government to have him uh, released and so that he can, he can uh, face state trial or speedy trial so that we can know as to whether he committed the act or not. Because a lot of times, too, people are being uh, accused falsely, but then we will not say it is false or it is true until they have appeared in a court of competent jurisdiction, which is the only area that determines as to whether an individual had committed rape or not. Um, I just wanted to say something. We 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 want to have one, you know, um, court, which is criminal court E, that is responsible to handle, you know, SGBV cases like rape cases. I mean, and um, it's it's another problem as well. So you have all these cases coming from the fifteen counties in Morovia. A lot of cases on the docket that are yet to be prosecuted. So at the end of the day, in the case of um, uh, the alleged rape case of Vanny Jersey, Tatos and the other people on the other side that he should be released. And people like me on the other side are saying he should be, you know, he should go to um, the, what the rape law says that um, he shouldn't be free on bail. And another problem is that Dennis, I mean, like I said, the problem around sexual gender violence is a lot. Some of these perpetrators are free on bail, like Tata just mentioned. So, I mean, the fight against SGBV. Well, yeah. Be yeah. <laughs> right. Hello. To Evo, let's talk about SGBV here in the diaspora. What are the cases that you know of? Sorry, guys. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Um, I don't know of cases specifically here, but um, I. Um, it, it do happen. It, it does happen here. Yeah, it does happen here. Um, but I'm not. I don't know of of cases specifically. Um, I think there was one in uh, Fargo or somewhere in Iowa. I think a a, a guy actually killed his his uh, girlfriend and ran away. And there are a whole lot of things that have been reported. There are some instances where some uh, incest are taking place and then the perpetrator will run away and go to Liberia before you know it. Wow. Yeah. So, so let, let, me, let me go back to you, uh, Titus, uh, as, we, as, we, as we wrap this up. You are, you know, constantly in the face of these things, you know, carrying on campaign, and sometimes there is not much cooperation. I, I saw from your from your Facebook that uh, there was this time that you took your comp your petition to the Ministry of Gender, and I think the deputy said they were not going to take it from you. They refused to accept your petition. So as you continue to do this, and you are stepping on toes, what's the risk involved? And are you afraid? 100% not afraid. I'm 100% prepared and I'm 100% not, not afraid. So we petitioned the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection as an institution even involving uh, Sata Shari and patient courtier Norukolu Harris and the likes of Tuku Jala, Albert Gople. There were so many activists who, who followed the last time and who participated. So when we, when we, just imagine, let me, let me just explain how pathetic this was. We hand deliver, we went to hand deliver our petition to, uh, the ministry, the, the, to the minister at the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection. Unfortunately, we were told that the assistant, mini, the, the assistant minister for administration, she told us that she was not in her right mind to receive any petition from, from us on that day. So what we did was, <laughs> yeah. So what we did was we had to sit at the entry and we told the people no one will enter and no one will go out until our petition is accepted. That was when she came out and she held our petition. And in fact, I told her, when you, when you look at the video, I told her to open it apologize to the young people who, 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 who protested in the rain and the suns. And at the end of the day, you said you, you're out of your mind. So you have to apologize to us before you even accept this petition. 
Fortunately for us, she apologized and she held our petition. The petition was read by Benito Yuri and the, the, the likes of so many activists as well. So when we hand deliver our petition, she told us that they're going to work around the petition to make sure that the case involving and Linda, Linda Sherman, Linda Z. Sherman, who was murdered on Kim Johnson rule, would be uh, truly investigated. It was a it was a gimmick. It wasn't investigated. When we hand deliver this petition at the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection, what happened next? Eventually, of uh, I think two 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 months ago, the late Linda Z. Sherman was buried in Brookfield. And a top six was not was not carried out on the on the remains of this child. The police conspired with the family to bury this child. The Ministry of Gender sat silently. Me, I'm not afraid. I'm always not afraid. I'm hundred percent ready. But this is where we are as well in Liberia. Because you are not afraid, but are you aware of the risk involved? I'm not, I'm not getting, getting you. you. Yeah, like somebody was calling you. That's why. I said, okay, okay, I'm you say you are not afraid, right? But are you are, are you a, are you aware of the risk involved? I'm aware of the risk involved. I'm even, I'm even aware that I, I I should have been beaten on on December twenty fifth, Christmas Day, but I escaped that that uh, that that brutal uh, conspiracy, which which was to be uh, inflicted on me, automatically because on that day was when. I knew that I had so many enemies and best friends because somebody came to me physically and told me, my man will come and be you. I said, what I do? You know, what do I do in the librarian would have expressed ourselves? What, what do I do or what have I done? And they could not give cogent, you know, narration. But what I just saw was a group of men try to attack me and I had to escape. So I know the breaks. So many times people will call me, people will text me. People will even try to buy me to say, oh, look, you have to get this amount of money. But just in the instance of infant parents, a guy texted me and said he wants to give me 20,000 librarian dollars to work with the, with, with the parent to release their child from the ministry, of, uh, from the central prison. I told him I'm not the court. I'm not the government. My responsibility is to only advance the affairs of women and children in Liberia to advocacy. So I know the risks and I know it and I'm prepared to face them always. Let, let me read a few comments on Facebook. Uh, Davina Kose, it needs to be the a collaborative and shared responsibility. However, gender ministry takes the greater responsibility. They must be heavily involved so that laws can be enforced and or changed. Another huge problem is to have a single court prosecuting these rape-related cases. Gladys Wilson says, are there basic things like DNA testing, rape kits, etc.? Uh, triple M family phone, they bury the truth and live in denial. That is why we need awareness and good education system to be put into place to help make the difference. The law and regulations of the country too has a role to play into all this. Musu Stewart said the system is broken, nothing works. And she, so those are a few, few comments. There's a comment I talked about DNA machine. It, yes. Oh, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> it so do you know that uh, like, Liberia had just one DNA machine, machine at the GFT? Just one. Just yeah. one. So in 2019, it got damaged. So this is the kind of system we are in. Yeah, so I mean, and the, and the machine was donated to um, uh, the, SG, the, the JFK and the Ministry of Gender by the United Nations Mission in Liberia. So before, when the UN was in Liberia, we didn't have like any machine, DNA machine. So, I mean, in terms of forensic, to examine uh, evidence that come in and stuff like that, we just based on the police report and what the, uh, the health workers say so when you go to the one-stop center and then they say oh yeah i mean they go to they examine you as a victim or a survivor whatever um you are at that point in time and then you take that report that report is what they call the ministry agenda and the police were based on to prosecute the perpetrator so yeah i mean having dna machine is another issue again <laughs> 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you are just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. We are discussing sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia. My guest, Ms. Sata Sharif, Mr. Titus Pakala, and Ms. Eva Sa. The last thing I want us to talk about here, which anytime we are discussing SGBV, we talk about is female circumcision or FGM, female genital mutilation. It, uh, Titus, I think you wrote about it and there's a campaign you're carrying on and uh, Eva also. Is FGM linked to SGBV in any way? Yeah, the the female female is it you do you want to answer Eva? No, go ahead, Titus. Okay, so female genital mutilation is is linked to uh, uh, SGBV, sexual and gender based violence, because what what happened it it occurs at 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 homes at domestic places as as well. Like for instance, the FGM is is also known as female genital cutting. You know, we have it here in Liberia. Oftentimes, traditionally, we boys don't talk about it. People will try to, you know, boo us. But I have to say, well, since our war is becoming a civilized war where we do not need to have uh, our girls to be tempered with. So it is, uh, they are interrelated and it is happening in Liberia here. And I recommended the government, I think a couple of times, because the Domestic Violence Act was passed in 2019. Guess what? When this domestic violence act was passed, it was excluding the female genital mutilation portion. So how can we fight sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia when you have excluded female genital mutilation portion of this document? So it tells you indeed that we are not utterly prepared to fight sexual and gender-based violence. Because FGM and SGV, they are interrelated, they are crimes. These are crimes that are perpetrated against people's consent because people are being forced to go and do a, a, a genital cutting. You understand? So you cannot pass and you cannot you cannot pass a document or policy excluding FGM and you are attempting to fight, you know, sexual and gender-based violence in Liberia. So it's kind of complicated and I don't know, Liberia is just a unique area to live and to see our, our own government officials. But we are yes. still fighting on it, recommending to government and the people of Liberia to ban, and especially when you say ban female genital mutilation in Liberia, it's like you have you have off the entire EDC in Liberia. Once you tell anybody, let's ban female genital mutilation in Liberia, it's like you have off EDC. And people are not just in support of banning female genital mutilation, yet in Sudan, Students in Africa here, just of recent, they ban female genital mutilation. What about Liberia? It does not have female genital mutilation, does not have any health benefit. I have read a whole lot of documents. It does not have health benefit. So where are we here to do? So I think we need to also tell the government to ban uh, the female genital mutilation. I was just discussing that with my team so that we can have this on uh, our platform discussing it as well so that next year or this year, we can have a massive gathering at the Capitol building asking the government to include FGM portion within the Domestic Violence Act that was passed in 2019 so that the rights of women, the rights of girls can be protected in Liberia. Yeah. Um, Dennis, you know, um, FGM is a cultural issue and um, like Tata said, not a lot of people um, want to have this conversation about female genital mutilation. Um, and the issue about the domestic violence bill, I remember one of the reasons why the domestic violence bill spent a long time in the um, House of Parliament is because there is this whole conversation about uh, FGM. Should we ban FGM because it's part of our culture as a country? So um, the issue about education, someone mentioned about awareness. I think when since we have the domestic violence bill has already been passed into law, what we need to do now is to start the conversation about female genital mutilation. We need to educate people. People need to understand that uh, we are not getting rid of, you know, um, the poor 
in the sentences I did talk about it, but what we're trying to do is to get rid of the harmful practices that are in you know, uh, uh, these groups. It, it's not like we're trying to erase everything totally. And and if we confront this conversation from a standpoint where we're trying to get rid of Liberia culture, it's going to be a big thing because society play a major role. And then when we go back to having a counter consultations and having group conversations because this is not only about the view of activists it's about the entire country and if people are not educated about fgm it becomes a problem so what am i trying to say what i'm trying to say is now that we have the domestic violence law maybe titles we can start to confirm this from you know a standpoint of creating more awareness and maybe designing a, a GM bill as well, because in the process of designing, it means we have to educate, we have to do public consultations, we have to do stakeholders meetings and convince people so that people are educated. Because I tell you, I was on the floor, I remember when they had this joint session at, uh, at uh, the House of Parliament and both Senate and the House of Representatives were joined in the joint chambers. And some of the people, and some of the reason why FGM was, you know, removed from the domestic violence uh, bill was because people feel that it's it's a cultural thing. It's something very important. It's important to our culture. And I know it's terrible that we have such a thing in place, but again, you can't just remove something with folds without having conversation and educating people who are not aware that it pulls more to the, to the growth and development of women. So there's a problem, it's linked with violence, um, forceful violence, and no one should be allowed to go through such a thing, a human rights violation without you know, um, consent and stuff like that. So yeah. Diva, anything to add? Um, for me, like um, Titus and, and Sata says, um, I understand that it's a traditional practice, but not everything that we do traditionally, you know, is for me right or should be in that sense. Because we say children are below the age of 18, um, are not able to consent or do not are not mature enough to make certain decisions. So when you take a child that is below the age of 18 and you say you have to do this or you have to do this um, um, FGM, are they fully understanding what is happening to them? Are they able to fully be able to consent to what you're doing to them and 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 be able to um, say this is it because they're not a, most of it is not done when you're when you're above the age of 18 or you're above your age of consent to say I want to do it is because oh this is some a tradition that's been going on for so many years so you as a as a child are are, are uh, 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 put into it not fully having that mindset, that maturity to understand what exactly it is and how it affects your body and what you should go through it. So we have to look at it from that, that standpoint. We have to do research to these actual people that it's done to instead of their families threatening them, oh, I will this, I, you, you, you don't do it, I will disown you. And I can tell about my uh, personal experience as a child. My grandmother uh, was a zoo and I was supposed to go, but my mother was steadfast in letting them know, you're not taking my child. You're not going to do this to her at this very young age. I was about, I think like seven or no, I was about six or, or, or so. I was very young, but they wanted to initiate me into that. And she was very adamant that this was not going to happen to her child because she could understand the impact and what it was and what they do. So when you take a child that's young and do something like that uh, to them and in the name of tradition, in the name of that's what's been being done on our society, do we really understand the psychological impact and the physical impact of what it is and why and what's being done to our children? Yes, uh, thank you for having us, and thank you for having such an interesting discussion.
Can you please talk a little louder? My, daughter, the, 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 my yeah. phone line is bad today. Oh. Okay. Hold on. Let me, let me get my uh, phone. I think that's what it is. Can you hear me, Montana? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Yeah, I'll get my Okay, I think, I think we're much better now. Okay, sorry about that, dude. Oh, uh, yeah. I remember there was time that even my mom and some other relatives finally trying to initiate my daughters. And I made I made sure that none of my kids uh, went to the senior dental medicalization. But there, there are a couple of things to take to account here when we're talking about uh, it's a crime. Liberia is governed by different laws, not just the constitution of Liberia. And as lawmakers, before they make any decisions with anything that regards customary practices, there is, there is a customary law. How can they consult the customary law about things that would not control uh, or cause any kind of commotion? But I, I strongly agree that something should be done about that. I, I think it, it is my, it is my uncle where I don't, I don't know about the word, you know, the phrase of a crime. But I think it should be done as part of it. My only suggestion is if they can get, I wanted to also fight about getting the UPF and other uh, uh, organizations that are against humanity to commit economic crimes and economic sabotage as well. So if you're going to support uh, customer practices, we should also offer uh, those systems to get a, uh, a project group that are in the most of other country area. And I prevent people from getting justice as well. But thank you so much, and, and to let us continue with this, with this application. And this is not a crime because it doesn't anywhere in which the library is going to function. Let us see how we can go to change the zone, the editor, and make them understand that the language in this kind of act affords no threat and no harm to their current practices. Thank you so, so much for having me. Thank you, Elio. Thank you. All right, let me uh, read a few comments, our last comments, and then you all can come in. Uh, talking about FGM, Musu Wanglo Stewart said, this is a highly controversial issue in most part of the world. Fasiki Song Kamara said, let us not just condemn FGM in our society, it was the practice of the traditional society. We need firstly educate them about the harm, the future, and what it brings to the right of the victims and traditional exhibits. And uh, Mosu also say the strategy, in my opinion, is not to tie FGM bill to the domestic violence. Uh, Sam Wolo say, can the panel say how tough librarian laws are on sexual and gender-based violence? and what specific punitive measures are available to prosecute to prosecutors to hold perpetrators accountable or if the laws are lenient and unhelpful what is missing and what does the panel recommend telco say thanks evil research and data is important in finding lasting solution to the problem the data matters uh, Mosu again is advising, approach the traditional leaders and engage them by explaining the harmful effects of FGM. If you can get majority of them to buy in, I think the FGM bill will have a chance. And our last caller was saying, uh, if we have to ban FGM or talk about FGM, then we have to talk about other societies like the UBF that they may not be doing genetic mutilation, but they are engaged in economic crimes or something along those lines his phone was not too clear so let me hear from which which one do you want me to well i replied to musu i know um um you have to get these traditional leaders um, um involved and 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 show them and research and a lot of these girls might be afraid to talk so you might have to talk with them also are they willing to share their stories or even some of the women um that go through it some of them uh they 
don't agree with it, but because the society says that it has to be done, they'll do it. But the, on the other hand, are these leaders and the and people receptive to the information that you're bringing to them? Are they receptive to trying to look at the changes? Because if one of the main re, uh, uh, things in your society is doing this, then um, what really is your society about? Is that the main thing that makes your society? And for me, I, I've tried to do some research on, I haven't really found a clear answer as to why, what is your main purpose? And it can't be, oh, that's tradition. Why do you feel so passionate about doing this? And why is it something that cannot be a, a change? Or even if you must uh, do it, like how they do circumcision, do you have people who are trained? Because some of these girls get it done in some very um, brutal ways or the person doesn't know how to do it and, and, and they get um, 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 hurt you know, really badly. Is there, is there other compromise or other things that can be done to make it safe or, 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 or what? I mean, for me, I wanna get rid of it, but if how can we make it better? Or if you have to do it, what else can be done um, in, in that sense? Yeah, so, I mean, like, uh, I, I, I read, I listened to, to you reading one of the comments, uh, particularly talking about engaging traditional leaders. What I, what I also suggest is that we first have to do like what I, I always consider as community forum, having community dialogue or forum, not just with uh, traditional people, but with people who, who live uh, far from the traditional setting, like for people who are already at the combined areas, have a community dialogue with them and have a general general perception of, of, of them as well, general view of how they look at the entire FGM to be, and then take it back to the rural area, the rural settlements where you're gonna be inviting paramount chiefs, town chiefs, clan chiefs, and the rest of uh, other traditional elders, bringing them forth to a town hall, a palava hall, you know, traditional meeting where you speak the vernacular, you speak your belly, you speak your loma, your malingo, tell them the effect of FGM and tell them, let them, you know, be like what uh, Eva has said earlier, be receptive as to what they will tell you, you know, be willing to agree as to what they will tell you the benefit of FGM. If they cannot tell you the benefit of FGM, then you tell them the risks of FGM. And I know they, when, once they accept the risks of uh, uh, the FGM, then I think they're gonna be part of this wider understanding of the FGM and making sure that we all have a comprehensive law that prohibits uh, the practice of female genital mutilation. But if Sudan can, you know, get rid of FGM, then what about Liberia? Other countries are banning FGM. What about Liberia? Is it just traditionally, you know, endemic in our country that we can't get rid of it? We can, we can do that. But it just requires a uh, general education uh, from the smaller, you know, uh, generation to the older folks and so that we can understand the consequence of FGA and so that we can also have our general support uh, in making action against this this practice in, in Liberia. And uh, Sada, you can you can comment, but uh, also include the question that was asked about whether the laws are lenient or they are very straight on uh, SGBV. Um, I would say we have um, some very good laws in Liberia um, within the entire West Africa. We have one of, you know, the strongest uh, rib law, but then there are a lot of gaps and implementation is a problem. Um, <coughs> Liberia is the only West African country with, you know, a children's law, that's a boost for us. But again, implementation is a problem. So, I mean, uh, we have the domestic violence uh, 
bill that was passed into law. And all of these documents, of course, prohibit violence against women and children. And so, yeah, the laws are there, but in terms of implementation, implementation is the problem. You have uh, structures in place like the Women Children Protection Session, um, the Ministry of Gender, SGBV Division. You have to police the judiciary um, who are not, you know, really doing their job to ensure that perpetrators are brought to justice. We have the overcrowdedness of cases on the docket of criminal code E, which is a huge problem. Um, less number of perpetrators are being prosecuted. Um, so, I mean, in terms of the, the, the laws do exist, like I said, implementation is the problem and we need to do more. And can you imagine the rape law doesn't talk anything about, you know, uh, marriage or rape. Like, if you marry, your husband can rape you and stuff like that. Somebody, the other day, I was at an um, event in Liberia and they were talking about it. And somebody was like, oh, that's not an issue. Of course, it's an issue and it's something we need to look at. Um, in terms of uh, compromisation, people who compromise rape kids, do we have a law? you know put in place to ensure that if you compromise a case the law can also hold you accountable so all of these things are also some of the gaps that need to be looked at and as activists of course we will continue to work and other people too that are out there we hope you can join the conversation to ensure that violence against women and children um is reduced and you know, uh, fought against in Liberia. And the issue about the domestic, uh, I mean, female genital mutilation. Um, like I said, and I will continue to say, it, education is the way forward because uh, this whole FGM issue is uh, a sensitive issue for 11 traps in Liberia. And um, I mean, a lot of tribes in Liberia, it's, 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 it's not just something that one group decided to, you know, go about and start practicing it. Uh, there are trainings within uh, these groups aside from the cutting that is also essential to the culture of Liberia. So how do we confront FGM from a standpoint where we not getting rid of uh, the, the positive aspect of the poor and the society, but actually trying to fight against the cutting aspect. And it starts with having conversations. It starts with educating people about the harmful effects of FGM. And it starts with, like you said, having traditional conversations. And I feel like uh, this fight against uh, FGM, the traditional council or the traditional leaders in Liberia should be at the front of it. I mean, because they are the ones saying, oh no, we can get rid of FGM. FGM is important. Since we have all the facts that say this thing is uh, bad for the health of women, we need to present the fact to them before we design a law different from domestic violence law. So all I want to say is we encourage everyone to join the fight against uh, social gender based violence in Liberia. And to all those who say, oh, they're the artifice and attacking the Ministry of Gender, the artifice attacking the government. If there was not a lot of issues and gap within the government, we wouldn't have been advocate. So if the gaps exist, we'll continue to talk. If the government and don't do that job, we'll continue to talk and we'll keep watching and looking at y'all. And thank you so much. Thank you. And no apology, continue to advocate. Let's have your, I want to thank you all very much for such discussion. And uh, we hope this continues. The issue of uh, sexual and gender based violence, that's very, very essential for us to be talking. There is no elephant in the room, you know, sometime. Uh, people will say, oh no, this is tradition, we can talk about this. Uh, it's all start with education, education as what, what we are doing tonight. So I want to thank all of you for your time. Let me get your closing comments and then we can wrap this up. We start with Titus. Uh, I think it's getting a little late at your end now. It's, it's 12 10 anyway. Thank, thanks to everyone. I want to say thanks to the family of uh, Focus on Liberia. I think this is my second time I'm, be, I'm being hosted. 
And so thank you again to you, uh, Sata. Thanks for sharing this platform with me. And uh, it says, Eva, I hope we talk again. I hope we, 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 we share oh, yeah. this platform. Yeah, I couldn't find you on Facebook, but I sent Sata a friend request. So I okay, wanted to I'm work there, with I'm you there. guys. I, I will search Definitely. for you anyway. So thanks to the people of Liberia, you know, who've been commenting and asking us the tough questions and participating as well. I hope to be here any longer and so we can share our stories. Thank you. Yeah, so like I said, thank you. Join the fight against ending violence against women and children. Please stay home and wash your hands. And um, if any government official listening, do your job. Stay <laughs> off Facebook. Stop attacking <laughs> activists. We're just trying to help you. Simple. Let's continue to work together. And I hope that um, by the end of COVID-19, we will learn our lessons. I mean, we learn a lot from Ebola and I hope we can use all the examples and the way we fought the Ebola crisis in Liberia. I hope we can all work together like that again to fight COVID-19 and to also protect women and children from domestic violence. And if you are a woman, a girl, or a man listening, or watching this video if you are abused sexually during this crisis or you think you are not safe and you need help the ministry agenda just said they have resources in place please reach out and ask for help if you have a friend you can go to go to the friend so thank you very much um like i was really happy to be on this panel. Thank you to Tata, Sis Eva, and you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Eva, your past closing comments. Um, I thank you, Dennis, for having me on. Um, it's it's been a pleasure. And Sata and Titus, I take my hat off to both of you for being, you know, so young and being out there and putting your voices out there to make these changes. Um, and we need we need more men in this fight. Um, also, we really do need more men in this fight. Speak up, um, say whatever. We need more advocates. We need more people to help. We need more collaborations with different groups, with different people. Um, we have to work with the with the ministry, even though our um, if you're taking what we're saying, you know, as personal, then then it speaks, you know, volume as to what you're put out there to do or what your passion is about what needs to be done. Call Sata, call Titus, call whomever that's that's out here talking. What can we do? How can we make it better? How can you help us? How can we work together? Because these issues are not going away. COVID-19 is here and it makes it worse. These children are being abused, can't go to school to escape um what's going on these women can't go out to market or the men are frustrated because they're not making money so it's a lot of issues that we all have to come together to work on them to make it better because when you have women and children that um thrive in a society that society grows that society um is is successful but if you have them being su suppressed we're not going anywhere. And we can see that in all different aspects of Liberia that we really have to get this under control and do better by our women, do better for our children and, and, and build a better Liberia. Well, I can't thank you all enough for your time and your expertise, very knowledgeable panel. I appreciate you, I appreciate all that you do for our country. Also want to thank our viewers those who call in those who commented and even those who will watch later we at focus on liberia we strive to educate to elevate and promote all things liberia so before we leave don't forget covid 19 is real observe the protocols and let's do all we can to keep covid out of reach until then my name is dennis ja on behalf of all of us here at focus on liberia saying god bless you good night Good night, everyone. We are Abira. Abira is our home. Abira people.